Well, with just a week until the local government elections and an even shorter time in which parties can actively campaign, today we focus on the role and importance of election observers. According to the Election Monitoring Network, there are over 1,800 accredited organizations acting as election observers, including security forces that are working with the Electoral Commission to ensure the delivery of free and fair elections. A part of their role is to ensure Sure that politicians refrain from using speech or actions that provoke either party supporters or members of the public to commit acts of intolerance or provocative actions that could trigger tensions of violence. Policy analyst and chairperson of the Election Monitoring Network, Nkosi Kulule Nimbezi, joins us now virtually to talk about this. Great to have you. Welcome to Morning Live. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. So, 1,800, this is a, a, a number, appears to be quite, quite a high one, but I suppose when you look at our population, we need around about those numbers. But what exactly do election observers do on the ground, and from which dates are you expected to start observing election-related political activities? Yes, we will remember that these are local government elections, and so election observers come mainly from local areas. And what we observe is the, is the compliance with the electoral code of conduct so that at the end we can say we have free and fair elections. So everybody has to play according to the rules. Nobody committing acts of intimidation, nobody pulling down posters of the others, and no, no, uh, uh, no go areas, as we know that uh, the issue of uh, violence uh, is still something that uh, we have in pocket for our country. So we are all eyes and ears in terms of that um, environment leading to the election day. And of course, uh, on the three days of, of voting, we'll also be in and around voting stations to ensure that voters vote peacefully. Yeah. I mean, I know that, you know, a couple of weeks before the elections, the IEC were calling for uh, as as many election observers as possible, just to ensure that these are free and fair and, and, and everything is sort of held in a peaceful manner with no intimidation whatsoever. So uh, have you spoken to the IEC? Are they, are they satisfied with the amount of election observers that are out there and will be in the communities ensuring this? Yes, uh, we are very grateful because the IEC accredits election observers and since the amendment of the electoral act we know that it is now organizations and institutions that are accredited as opposed to individuals so we are also happy in terms of the information sharing between the IEC and the civil society to say these are the issues to emphasize on since the legislation was amended particularly this time around because of the COVID-19 health protocols that all of us have to observe in terms of what we do inside the voting station, inside the voting uh, districts. Uh, there have been these new updates that we had to be abreast of, and the IC has been most grateful in sharing information and facilitating the accreditation of election observers. Mm, mm. I mean, if we look at previous elections, and as you say, these are local government elections, but um, previously we used to have perhaps between, in, in these kind of elections, I'm not sure the, the local government elections, but in, in national elections, there'd be between four and 6,000 election observers. Now we're looking at a number of 1,800. Again, I ask you, is, is this enough? Do you feel that this is enough to ensure that these elections are free and fair? Because we know the big role that election observers do play. Oh, no. Let me clarify in terms of those numbers. The number you're quoting is the ones that the Electoral, the Election Monitoring Network has been active in training and deploying. But there are many more election observers that will be on the ground. We know that the international uh, observer missions are beginning to arrive now that... Uh, we are doing the countdown. So the number is increasing, and I'm sure with the tally we will get from the IEC accounting for other applicants is going to be much more significant. So that is also a sign of encouragement Good. to say that there are people who have been trained and who are going to be deployed. We were fortunate in terms of 
our composition, the, our constituents include faith-based organizations such as the KwaZulu Natal Christian Council in KZN, uh, Electoral Code of Conduct Observers in the Western Cape. So to the extent that we also have faith-based organizations, people who have pulpit and uh, captive audience and institutions, we have been able to disseminate this information and to recruit and to be able to deploy locally. Yeah, fantastic, because their role is massive. I mean, in particularly when you look at the, the counting, you know, when those doors close and you've got the, the counting that's underway, you have the election observer there that plays a very big part of, of being the eyes of civil society, and that's important. So the training that's been taking place, let's, let's talk to that. It's happened in four provinces, if I'm correct. It's Gauteng, Eastern Cape, Western Cape, and KwaZulu-Natal. So let's, let's talk about um, the, the actual role of an election observer and what they are expected to do if they do pick up signs of unacceptable conduct, intolerance or cheating during counting and, and so on? Uh, first of all, is just to ensure that uh, political parties stop campaigning uh, and they don't campaign inside the voting station parameters. Of course, people are allowed to wear their T-shirts and their party regalia but they need, there must be no campaigning on the days of election. The other thing is to ensure that the IEC itself sticks uh, to the program by opening voting stations on time, ensuring that all the materials are present so that people can start voting on time. Uh, even towards the tail end of voting, to ensure that those who are on the line at the cutoff time, 7 p.m., they are able to be given the opportunity to still vote and our voter education has been about uh, saying to the voters, go out and register, have your ID. Even those who have lost their IDs, you can still go to the Home Affairs Department to get a temporary ID. As long as your name is on the voters' roll, you will be able to vote. Mm. The emphasis has also been on independent candidates. We have a new and a growing number. They are contesting for the first time so as to help them navigate uh, the system. Of course, because we have more any vote, uh, uh, the ballot papers are long. So it means that because of COVID, not all parties can send party agents to be physically present. So they have to take 10 on rotational basis to be physically present inside the voting station. So as election observers, we have been active in facilitating those informal uh, agreements between political parties as to who do you let in first and who do you entrust while you are outside the voting station. And that has worked pretty well. There was a, a statement that was made um, saying that um, if KwaZulu-Natal are ready, that uh, basically reassuringly answers the questions as to whether we are ready for these elections, then we're good to go. Why KZN? What's up with that? Oh, yes. I, I, I did mention that in my opinion piece as well. Yeah. To say that KwaZulu-Natal is a province with a name and a surname. So we take a cue from it. But also just in terms of the, uh, the number of concerns, the hotspots, and number of intimidations, KwaZulu-Natal has been on a red zone, some pockets of it. Mm -hmm. uh, we have unique structures there that uh, allow political parties, civil society to, to work with uh, the IEC because some of the problems that militate against freeness and fairness of elections they emanate from things that have no relationship with the election. So you have to deal with them at a broader level. So to the extent that in KwaZulu-Natal, we have uh, seen the level of cooperation amongst political parties, the level of tolerance uh, for people in terms of the putting up of posters, it gives us confidence. Yes, violence and killings has been different a bit this time. It has focused on traditional leaders in the past uh, 9, 11 months, uh, something which is a concern, killing of officials who are traditional leaders. To the extent that traditional leaders work directly with municipal councillors, we remain concerned and say it's something that must be provided attention. Of course, there are also fewer cases where there are complaints about the demarcation of municipal wards, which is a big issue. When people are dissatisfied, at the outcome of the municipal demarcation board processes, they tend to ventilate their anger towards the IEC by disrupting elections 
at least we believe this time around all of that is under control. One of the worrying things that you have also brought up is the fact that there's lack of evidence that communities actually do report those that are breaking the law um, to the police. And even more worrying is the lack of police successes in investigating and bringing prosecution to these perpetrators of such violations. Um, I know that on Friday last week, Morning Live actually spoke to Police Minister Becky Tele, who says the uh, political task team that was formed in 2018 ahead of the 2019 general elections is, is hard at work investigating political hits in KZN. I mean, any idea of its success rate in terms of cases they have cracked? Because I'm going to throw in there the fact as well that, you know, it really does look like that even in courts, Harsh sentences are never really handed down to these perpetrators that are, are really messing with, with the electoral system. And what, let, let's get your views on this. Oh, that is the most unfortunate picture in all of this, uh, in that the success rate is very poor. Yeah. And as we say, it starts from local community members who might have witnessed these incidents, not coming forward to report them and not providing the police with evidence so that there can be cases that are tied taken into court for prosecution but also it looks like the police are lukewarm in their approach because even in instances where evidence and information has been offered uh, it just uh, goes uh, unnoticed on the side of the prosecutors we needed to see confidence to say even if we had 12 or more cases at least four of them have been successfully prosecuted in a manner that sets out an example that this is completely uh, unacceptable. Yes, I have mentioned that sources of uh, these conflicts emanate from things that are outside of the electoral process. Taxi wars, uh, fighting for spaza shops, drug lords, you name it. And uh, we need to cast the net wide. And to the extent that we need to enjoy this right of freedom of security, we needed to see more. And I think that is something we need to redouble our efforts towards, to say that we need to have those who are responsible taken or, um, by the long, long arm of the law. Mm. There's a, a very interesting um, article. I mean, we keep referring to it, but it is a, it's an interesting one where you address a concern that ANC President Cyril Ramaphosa's labelling of voters as drunk when they criticised the party for failing on service delivery while campaigning in Kharanku in Pretoria. I mean, you, you basically go on to say that it sums up the term of the administration that is now drunk on power, saying his comments are unpresidential and undermine the intelligence of the voters that have been failed. Is that one of the behaviours that observers do take note of? And, and how do you act on something like this? Yes, uh, we, 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 we talk about those things because they start at a level where we say we do not tolerate inflammatory statements, labeling uh, that uh, can uh, present prejudice and stir up emotions such that people are cast out, uh, especially now that at local government level we have independent candidates. Uh, they are stigmatized by these big parties, so it is quite unfortunate for him to have said that. And that mm. is why everybody is looking forward to say South Africans must vote differently this time around in a manner that um, divorces uh, politicians who don't care in this marriage of inconvenience. Because we have seen that most South Africans have been let down time in and time out. Yeah. So what we're looking for and hope for is a high voter turnout that every South African will see on the ballot paper a person or a party that they can associate with so that the outcome can be legitimate. Indeed, discouraging and dissociating from inflammatory statements made by politicians. So Wednesday, that's it. Political parties have to stop campaigning by Wednesday so we can, we can stop seeing all the promises that are being made in, in rallies and all of that. So there's the cool-off period that'll take place um, ahead of the special vote that happens on the 30th of October. And then, of course, elections on the 1st of November, which is a week from today. So um, this is an important part uh, to already election observers to start watching and ensuring that everybody abides by that, I imagine. Yes, and to the extent that it has been quiet, successful, this road towards these elections, we hope it remains the same. Good. We ask all role players to be vigilant because when we start voting, the focus is on the voters and the candidates. And we need to let them shine and allow nothing to destabilize the environment 
such that uh, we can militate against the freeness and fairness of elections. All South Africans must claim these rights and enjoy them successfully. All right, let's leave it there. Nkosi Kulule Nyembezi, thank you for talking to us. Of course, a, a policy analyst and chairperson of the Election Monitoring Network. And his organization is one of the election observers. And he was talking about the significance of the role played by observers in ensuring a peaceful, free and fair elections. Seven o'clock. Let's get your news. Sakina's telling by.